Welcome to this uh, webinar. And I, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the new board member in uh, Fecto, joined this spring, um, and then from Denmark. Uh, and today, Shrao is going to tell us a little bit and a short presentation of Shrao. He is a qualified as a vet in Portugal in 2000, 2007 and was qualified as an expert in veterinarian dentistry and what do you call maxillary? Maxillofacial, yeah. Yes, <laughs> surgery uh, by the John Plutens University of Madrid in 2011. And he obtained a PhD fo focusing on research in the field of donkey dentistry in 2013. He was appointed as a Professor of Medicine and Surgery in, of Equus in Portugal in, also in 2013 and joined the Donkey Sanctuary in 2016. He has a extensive donkey medical and welfare experience in Europe and with working, and with working donkeys globally in, is a regular lecturer, tutor and practical assessor in Equidentry Dentistry worldwide and has published, published several articles and contributions to books. Um, he is the chair of the Portuguese Association of Animal Attraction and the Factory European Dwarf, Dwarf Horse Federation. And the title of this presentation is The Importance of Dental Care for the Health and Welfare of Working Equids. So, we start. <laughs> Thank you, Nana. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, uh, welcome for all that for for all those that join us today. It is my absolute pleasure to cover um, uh, this subject. It's it's an area that I I develop a lot of work. I I, I am a, a welfare person, and I soon understand that some areas are critical for the health and welfare of these animals. So all my studies and the vast majority of my academic publications were focused on uh, dental care, especially on donkeys. So uh, today, and that was a, a topic that I proposed to the FACTO board and they accepted, today we are going to cover the importance of dental care for the health and welfare of working equids. What I'm going to say is of course valid for all equids, but because this is a FACTO webinar, I, I give my focus on working equids. Okay, so. First, first of all, I think it's important for us to, to understand what dentistry is and to understand how the lack of treatment may affect the health and welfare of, of these animals. And as well as how important are these types of events and in terms of education and uh, so, so the owners can better understand the importance of these areas. So as the main aims for today, we will try to better understand the, equin, the unique nature of equis mouth. And by doing this, we'll understand why dentistry is so important in all species, of course, but mainly for equids. We'll try to encourage a greater awareness for the need, of the need for equidentistry and consequences of neglect in this species. I will try to be aware of a more common, I will explain you so you can be aware of the more common problems affecting equids. And to understand the challenges so many equids worldwide may face due to the lack of continuous veterinary and dental treatment, and of course, the importance of education at all levels. So these five topics are the, the, the areas we would like to focus uh, today. So first, I would like to talk a little bit about the unique nature of equids mouth, okay? I think it's very important. If you understand this unique nature, you will better understand the type of diseases, the type of disorders uh, that may affect this, these animals. And I'm not going to enter into detail in specific disorders. That's not the objective of the, the talk today. But I think these uh, initial points are important for all of us to be at least on a basic level in terms of uh, dentistry. So as some very basic information, like all mammals, the equids, and when I say equids, we need to understand from the equidia family, in this case, I'm talking specifically about donkeys, horses, and mules. They all have uh, two sets of teeth, like we do, like dogs, like cats, like any other mammal. And this is important because we, these, these animals, they have first the deciduous or the baby teeth, and then over time, 
they will have those deciduous teeth changed by the definitive, okay? And this is important because this is a, 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 a process that happens in all the animals during the first five years of age. So by knowing this, we know that the most active period inside equid's mouth corresponds to the first five years of age, meaning that these animals should start receiving dental care since very young age. And this is important. The second point I'd like to, to, to mention is that we have four groups of teeth and we are going to see them in detail in a second. We have the incisors, we have the canines, we have the premolars and we have the molars. Each one of these groups with different functions, okay? And that means that these animals, they may have up to 44 teeth in total. So we assume that uh, an adult equid with a full mouth, they can go up to 44 teeth, okay? So just sharing some pictures with you. Here we have, for example, an animal with two and a half years old where you can perfectly see the central. Here you can see the central incisors, these four that are the definitive tooth. And here you can see the milk tooth. This, this image is pretty much to illustrate what I mentioned about the two sets of teeth. On the other side, what you have here, and let me see if I can use one of these tools, the pen. So here you have, this is a skeleton of a donkey, okay? And here you can see we have the incisors. Just let me change the tool to the highlighter. So here, it's not working, so that's okay. Can you, can you see my, yeah. my mouse? Yeah, so yes. in the front one, we have the incisors, okay? Six in total in the uppers, that's in the maxilla, and six in the mandible. And these teeth are the ones that the animals use to cut the grass from the field. These, these uh, animals are herbivores, equids are herbivores, and they use these teeth to, to eat, to, to, to cut the grass. Then these triangular ones that we have here, they are the canines, okay? So we have this gap in between the incisors and what is called the cheek teeth, that is called the diastema, and this gap can be interrupted by the canines. The canines, it's usually more common in males than in females, although those more rustic, these more native breeds like donkeys, like the donkeys I used to work, or some of the draft horse, is not uncommon to see canines even in females, okay? Why this diastema is important? Actually, this diastema is important because this is the, 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 the structure, the anatomical structure, where we usually put the bit. So this is the area of contact of the bit. So in some cases, you will see problems here, not affecting the teeth, but affecting the bone if the hands of the user is too rough. And then what we have, we have six, cheek teeth on each one of the air kites. Three of these teeth are premolars and the other three are molars. But what happened, they call cheek teeth because to be honest, if we extract one premolar and one molar, it will be very difficult, if not impossible, to make a difference between the one and the other. Why? Because during the last 60 million years of evolution, the teeth of the, the equids, they suffer what it was called, the premolars, suffer what is called a molarization pro process. So they are all the same and they work as a functional unit. And the function of these teeth is to smash. So the incisors will cut and the cheek teeth will smash the food. So this process is actually the beginning. What happened in the mouth is actually the beginning of the digestive process. So if these animals are not able to cut and to chew properly the forage that should be the basis of the diet, every single other process in the digestive system and in the, in the digestive process will be affected because the first step is not happening okay. So another view, here you can see what we pretty much did is we just removed the maxilla, going back to the previous image, sorry. So that's up apart, we just, this is the, the mandible and we just split it into two. And here you can see, so this is the maxilla, this is the mandible, and as you can see, we have per arcade, we have one, two, three incisors, we have the canine, and then we have what is called the wolf tooth. I believe some, some of you already hear about the wolf tooth. Here you can see this very small one, 
okay? It's a, it's, it's a, it's, it is a vestigial tooth, so it was a premolar that never suffered this molarization pro process. And then we have one, two, three premolars and one, two, three molars. And as you can see, they work as a perfect unit. And 11 teeth plus 40 arcades, we have the 44 that I told you, okay? So after understanding this basic concept of the type of structure, of anatomical structures that we're talking, there are some very important anatomic aspects that you should keep in mind so you can understand the nature of, the unique nature of the equids mouth. The first aspect is to mention that Equids, they have what is called ipsodon teeth, and it's like a, an expensive word, ipsodon teeth. It comes from the Latin and it pretty much means large crown, okay? And you'll understand in a second why this large crown is important. You may, you may hear lots of people saying that the teeth of the equids, they grow continuously. Actually, that is not true. They just erupt continuously. And that means that when an animal is around five years old, they have all the teeth that they're going to need throughout their life there. But what you have is probably 80 to 90% of the tooth is hidden. And then over time, what is going to happen is a continuous eruption that is compensated by a continuous wearing rate. So you have the lower teeth in continuous contact with the upper teeth. And in this intimate contact that we have here, there is going to be a continuous eruption, like if we're talking about the stones of a milling system. So basically, there is a continuous wearing rate of around three millimeters per year, and what we have is actually uh, an eruption of three millimeters per year. So the teeth that we see inside the mouth, they apparently they have exactly the same size over time, but what is happening is continuous wearing versus continuous eruption, okay? And then, that's another expensive word. It's called an isognatic jaw conformation. What does it mean? It means that the mandible is narrower co when compared to the maxilla. Okay, let's see step by step. First point, here you have, this is an x-ray of a dog and the teeth of the dog are very similar with ours. So we have the crown and then we have the roots. If you see this image here, you can perfectly see the crown and you can see the roots. When you look to the next x-ray of a horse, what you see, again, we have the incisors and then we have the cheek tooth. And if we convert this x-ray into an image where we remove the bones, actually what you see, look here, we have the, the mandibular teeth, we have the maxillary teeth. This is what is called the clinical crown, what we can see. But then here you have an immense, an immense area of reserve crown, okay? So here, this red line represents what is the, the, the palatine bone, okay? So if you open the mouth of this animal, this is what we see. What happens? In this contact area here, we have that continuous uh, wearing rate of three millimeters per year. And then over time, these teeth in this direction, they erupt at the same rate of three millimeters per year. What does it mean in, in, in practical terms? If these teeth, they have around 10 centimeters, that's a more or less the size from an adult horse, these teeth, they are going to have 10 centimeters. If, and if they appear here in the first five years of age, if we have an eruption rate of three millimeters, that means that after 10 years, they disappear three centimeters. And after 30 years, 99 centimeters of these teeth disappear. So after 30 years of age in a natural process, horses will start losing the teeth. So uh, in, in the, the animals that I saw that they live for, for longer, usually after 30, 35 years, they lost the teeth. So in the nature, these animals will naturally die because they will not have the capacity to eat, okay? And if we eliminate the bone here, you will see something similar. The incisors, they curve like this, and this is what you would see, okay? So looking at this draw, we have the lateral view. And if we start twisting the head 90 degrees and you make a cut, what is called a transversal cut, cut like this, what we would see is an image like this. So what we have here, we have the transversal cut. This is the tongue, okay? These are the bones of the mandible with the two teeth. 
And then these are the maxillary teeth. So the anisognathy teeth that I just mentioned means that the mandible, this is a normal closed mouth, okay? Do you all understand the, the image? No. Tongue, oral cavity, the mm -hmm. palatine bone. And as you can see, in normal conditions, the mandible is much narrower than the maxilla. Why is that? Well, because if you think these animals are herbivores. So if I convert this image into, into a scheme, and I'll show you in a second, you will understand how this mouth is actually designed to eat this kind of diet. So let's take exactly the same scheme. Here you have palatine bone, the tongue, lower teeth, upper teeth. Clear? Mm -hmm. So this is the shoeing pattern of an equine. They will, sorry, I just jumped one. They will open the mouth laterally, what is called the opening phase. They will close the mouth and smash the food, and then it goes back to the center. And here is where they get the food. And these animals, they can do this, or depending on the studies. So this is, when you see an animal eating, this is what they do. It's a kind of an eight shape. They open it, goes laterally, smash the food, come into the center and go into the other side. And this is important, why? Because depending on the studies, these animals have one of this cycle. It's an average, I would say, one cycle per second. And this is very important because imagine, it can go up to 60,000 cycles every 24 hours. So imagine what this may represent if these animals have any kind of dental disorder that pretty much block this cycle. And another important thing that links with, with the last webinar that we have last week about nutrition, if you look to data, these animals will need 800 to eat one kilo of concentrated feed. They will only need 20 minutes and they will only need 800 chewing cycles. Although, and it's going to be a much more vertical. Why? Because the animals, they don't need to move the, the jaw so laterally to smash a concentrated food, a diet that is already half processed. Although when we go to the forage, the same kilo, but instead of concentrated feed, we're talking about hay, animals will need one hour and 3.5 thousand chewing cycles and in a much more lateral uh, dimension. Actually, it's very interesting because a few years ago, uh, Nicole Dutois, that is a, a, a researcher from, from South Africa that did her, her PhD in the UK, she showed that this anisognathia, meaning the difference, the percentage of the anisognathia in horses was 23%, meaning that the mandible is 23% narrower than the maxilla, although in donkeys goes up to 30%. And the reason for that is because donkeys originally came from a very dry area where the, 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 the food, the fiber, was really, really rough. So if the food is more rough, the animals will need to move more the jaw laterally so they can be able to chew the food, okay? So it's very important that linking this webinar with, with one that we saw last week, that the animals are able to have access to good quality uh, straw or hay or forage because their mouth is actually designed to chew good quality or bad quality, doesn't matter, rough diets, okay? So we saw some important details here. We saw that because we have two sets of teeth, the most dynamic process happens within the first years of the animal. And that means the eruption of the baby teeth, then the contact between the upper and the lower baby teeth, then the entire process of changing the baby teeth by the definitive teeth. And for example, in the case of the molars or the canines, they don't have milk teeth. So when they appear, we have already the definitive one appearing, okay? So first five years of age, it's very important that we pay close attention to the health and welfare, to the, to the, to the oral health of these animals. And because in the, when these things are happening, if something goes wrong, we can be proactive and we can try to intervene. When, if we just open a mouth of an animal with 10 years old for the first time, and the problem is there, since the animal was two, it's going to be much more difficult to solve the problems. So the question is, what if? What if something happens in the first years of life? And I just said, 
if there is a mismatch in a position. You saw that the mouth is designed to have all the lower teeth in contact with the upper teeth, counting, of course, with his and his And what if equids do not receive dental care throughout their life? I'm going to show you some examples, for example. These are newborn donkeys. On the upper left side, you have an animal with an extreme case of what is called brachignetia, meaning that the mandible, so this is the mandible, it's much shorter than the maxilla. And in the other side, we have the opposite situation. So we have the mandible that is longer than the maxilla. And this is an hereditary problem. Of course, these animals, if this, this actually was a, a, an animal that was dead when he was born. But imagine if this animal grows, he will probably have a mouth like this. You see the uppers and the lowers. So this animal will have very, very hard time when he needs to go to a field and use the incisors to cut the grass. You all can imagine that the grass will only be available to cut if it was smashed between these incisors and these incisors. What I'm going to show you next is actually the x-ray of this animal. And you don't need to be a vet or an expert to see that this is the maxilla and the mandible is completely blocked. So we have the maxilla and the mandible is completely blocked here. So this natural shoey movement that I show you going, this mandible will not be able to move to the left and to the right or in front. Although the, the, the main shoeing movement is mainly lateral, we also have what is called rostrocaudal mov movement. So basically the jaw should be able to move free to the left, to the right, in front or in the back. A little bit like our jaw does when we speak or we eat. So every mechanical blockage that doesn't, doesn't allow this process to happen will really interfere in the health and welfare of the animals. And please don't forget that I mentioned that these teeth, they erupt continuously. What does that mean? So that means that the areas of non-contact will erupt without resistance and will increase more and more the problem. Let's show you an example, okay? Sorry, that's the other way around. Okay, let's assume what we have here, one, two, three, four, five, six, is a row of chick teeth, okay? The first three molars, the premolars and the molars, and these are the mandibular ones, okay? This is a normal situation where the upper teeth and the lower teeth are in full contact. Now, if we go to a situation like the one I just showed you, something like this, it is normal that the same way you don't have contact in here, you will not have contact in the back, okay? So what is going to happen? here is that the rostral aspect of the maxilla and the lower aspect of the last cheek teeth, mandibular one, they will not have contact. If they don't have contact, they don't have the normal wearing process. So what you see is not actually an overgrowth, is a lack of wearing. But from, from a clinical point of view, this is what you would see. So in an animal with that case of brachignatism, what is called overjet, this is the typical situation that you will find. What happened here? Basically, this tooth is not in contact with the opposite one. So what you see, you see a sharp structure, you see lesions in the soft tissues, but at the same time, you have to imagine that if this animal wants to move the jaw freely, he will not be able to do it, okay? And the reason why this structure is here is because no one was proactive and interventive when no one checked that there was a, a, a brachignatism or a prognatism in these cases. And a point that I would like to make here is that, of course, these cases are treatable, okay? You can solve with a surgery these cases of what is called malocclusion. But I, I did this a couple of times and I, never, I end up never doing the surgeries because people ask me, because the animal was available, they ask me to treat the surgery and you can solve this between the two months old and the six months old okay but i said to the owners i will do that but you need to sign both were males i said you need to sign a paper saying that when this animal will be six months old or the testicles will be down we castrate this animal that means that we will solve the problem on a welfare ground so this animal can eat properly 
but we are not hiding a problem so that horse will become a stallion in the future and pass this to the, fall, to the falls because this is an hereditary problem. And the owner didn't want to castrate the fall, so I refused to, to do the surgery. It is very important. It is important to solve these cases from a welfare ground, but the, the owners and the people need to know that the falls can appear with this problem, okay? Just another example, for example, looking at this, this is the mandible and look what happened. These are the milk teeth, but here we have the definitive teeth erupting, but for some reason, the milk tooth, the milk teeth are still here, okay? So in this case, it's what you call, it's a very common problem called the retention of the milk teeth. And if they are not removed, they will cause a problem in the future, okay? So what I want, what I want to tell you, it's pretty much that dentistry is a very complex area where you can have all kinds of dental problems affecting not only the teeth, but also affecting the soft tissues, and we will see. And it, 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 implies, it implies actually that animals should start receiving dental care from a very young age. So situations like this is even a more complex situation will happen if we don't look after the animals. This is just an example. That's another example of a, of a mouth is completely destroyed. You can even see that in the hard palate you have scars and cuts from the contact with the lower teeth. So you can reach to a very high level of neglected mouth that will really affect the health and welfare of, of these animals. So uh, I, believe, I believe you see all these images and I think your next question is, okay, you're showing me very bad pictures, but how often such things happen, right? I think that's a fair question, especially because the vast majority of the owners, they always have this, the typical comments, well, my animal is fat, uh, so for sure the mouth is okay. The animal doesn't complain, so the animal for sure is okay. I don't see any signs, so the animal is for sure okay. Well, working with donkeys, and those of you who work with donkeys know that a donkey may be dying, and apparently the animal is okay. So uh, what I want to say is that dental disease is actually, and this is coming from many different studies, is considered the second most common medical condition of donkeys, just after uh, lameness situations. F situations affecting the hoof, that's the first one. Uh, disorders affecting the mouth is actually the second one. So I'd like to share with you, and I'm not going to enter in detail, but I think we all understand prevalence. We all understand percentage. So I'm going to share with you some of the data from my PhD. And what I did in my PhD, I took 800 donkeys, 400 from a breed, the Mirandese donkey, and 400 from another breed, uh, the Zamorano donkey. And the unique feature of this population is that more than 95% of these animals, they never receive any kind of dental treatment. So it was like the kind of immaculate population. And the best thing about taking in a population like this is that what you find there is actually the normal prevalence that the disorders will happen if you don't treat the animals. Okay, so we took these 800 animals and you divide them in, in seven groups. Less than two and a half years, two to two and a half to five, six to 10, 11 to 15, and then groups of five, okay? Mainly females, and that was the typical population there, some stallions and some geldings, okay? And then I went to all the villages in the area, drove 40,000 kilometers, visit 86 communities, villages, and spent 15 months with these people uh, in the villages. I had to drink a lot of glasses of wine, that's for sure, and Pete knows that it's the first thing they will offer you when you reach to their places. But it allows me to do a very big, was probably the biggest clinical trial ever done in Europe over the last 50 or 60 years. And what I did, I organized this in terms of incisors. So I divide the teeth into the main groups, the incisors, the canines, and then the cheek teeth. This is a list, this is the list of the disorders. And what I just want you to show you, and we just, we look for the general prevalence, but we also look for the age. That's why we divide it into groups. So we could understand if there was a disorder that was specifically from a group, or if with age, these disorders will increase or decrease. So just looking for some very basic, please pay attention. 
74% of these donkeys, they have some kind of disorder affecting the incisors, okay? 74%, that's a lot of animals, okay? And then when we look, when we look to, and you can see, for example, 49%, 40% in brachygnetism and 40% um, in, in prognatism, meaning the malocclusions, affected 49% of the population. So basically half of these animals, they have some kind of malocclusion. And this clearly shows that there was no careful selection of the, of the stallions. Because when you, when you deal with endangered species, you cannot afford to select the females, but you need to be very careful selecting the males because those are the ones you can select, okay? But for example, when you look, when you look to, the, to these uh, situations and you see the prevalence by age, you can see, for example, that it really increases. The younger animals, 56%, going up to 90% of donkeys with, with uh, incisors disorder. So age, it is a problem, a little bit like us, right? We are getting old and more and more uh, teeth problems are affecting us. Although, for example, the craniofacial abnormalities, they were not related with age, but for example, when you look to periodontal disease, starting from 2.5, going up to 32%. But for it's example, like when we look to re the retained incisors, you can perfectly understand that is a specific disorder of group two between two and a half and five, that is exactly when the exchange of the milk tooth by the definitive teeth happens. So again, we need to be proactive in this, in this moment of the life. When we look at the cheek teeth, the numbers are even higher. Look, almost 83% of these animals have some kind of cheek teeth disorder. And then when you look by the age, you can see that the vast majority of them increase with age, the overgrowth, the periodontal disease, the diastema. But again, the retained deciduous premolars are affecting mainly the group two. Once again, showing the importance of looking at this animal since a young age, okay? Some of the examples, as you can see, gaps in between the teeth, this focal overgrowth affecting, affecting the, the animals, what is called diastema, that is, an abnormal space in between teeth and you can see it was on both sides. You can see the gap and you can see the food entrapment here that will destroy the tissues around the mouth. So the next thing I would like to, to, to mention is the clinical signs that may indicate potential dental issues. And this is valid for those who have animals because if you see this in an animal, it may actually indicate you as an owner that this animal may have some problem. Okay. As I told you, the mouth is a, is, a, is, a, is a very complex structure. And the problem with the mouth is that, and it's something the owner should be aware, the clinical signs do not always manifest on early stages. There is a high number of animals suffering from asymptomatic dental and oral disorders, especially donkeys, mules, and draft horses that are stoic by nature. And what I want to say is that you will not see some of these animals with this terrible mouth the mouth is that I show in the pictures, the body condition was three, four, and sometimes five. So there's not a link between how bad the mouth is and the body condition of the animal, at least at the beginning. Then of course, it will become chronic problems and it will affect the animals, okay? So what are the main problems or the main clinical signs we'll see? One of them is quitting, and quitting means that the animals, they just drop the food in small balls. So when the animals chew because of this rotational system of the mandible, the, what they do is they just put the food in a kind of, uh, I would like to say like cylindrical structures, a little bit like, a, imagine a sausage made of straw. That's how the food goes into the mouth, so it's ready to go through the esophagus. If the animals have problems chewing, they will drop this, they will drop these, these structures and we'll see them and we'll find them. Then some of them, they have what is called this hamster mouth. You see them keeping the, keeping the food in between the cheeks, trying, trying to avoid the contact usually between the soft tissues and the teeth. The animals, they pack the food in the cheeks. Then you have halitosis. Halitosis is pretty much bad smell from the mouth usually as a result of the packing of the food in these diastomas, these 
these uh, abnormal spaces. So the food is packed in there and it starts a lot of fermentation process and the smell is, is quite intense. Petialism, petialism meaning the incapacity, the animals are pretty much dropping saliva from the mouth. Many animals, they may have repetitive colic episodes, mainly infection colics. Why? Because they are not, one of the main reasons for the shoeing movement is to reduce the size of the particle. So if the animals are not shoeing proper, properly, they are ingesting the food in bigger dimensions and that will cause uh, colics. Okay, so animals with many episodes of colics, it's, it's maybe uh, an indication for teeth. There is a loss of the body condition score and may also be nasal discharge. Why? Because if you remember that picture that I show you, the transversal cut, there is a very intimate relation between the roots of the teeth and the nasal cavity and the, the, the nasal sinus. So if there is an infection because there was a fracture or because there is some disease affecting the roots, the, 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 the radical area of the teeth, it may cause a secondary sinusitis and you'll see a nasal discharge. Usually, if an animal has a lung problem, you see a bilateral discharge. So you see mucus coming out of both nostrils. When it's teeth related, you will mainly see it on one side, okay? So here you have, and of course you can see blood in the mouth. You can see head shaking and head shaking. It's, it is in a specific, but it clearly says that there's something wrong with the head of the animal. You will see change in behavior mainly related with work. Why? Because the, the systems we use to communicate with the animals, imagine that you have one of these animals with one of these very sharp structures and you are driving the animal and that structure is on the right side of the animal. When you pull the rein on the left, actually what happens is that you release the, 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 the bridle on the left, but you increase the pressure on the right. So usually when a rider, a logger, uh, someone who works with an animal will say that my animal is fighting with me to the left. Usually the problem is on the right. Why? Because we are pretty much by pulling on the left, we are stimulating the contact between the bridle and the soft tissues and the teeth. And if you have one of these situations where there is an ulcer or something affecting the animal, uh, the animal will complain. We can have a symmetric head. And if we are used to have to, to pay attention to the normal shoeing movement and the sounds of our animal eating, if you don't see this normal shoeing movement, this eight movement that I show you, you'll be able to detect uh, situations, uh, abnormal situations. The reason why I'm putting these pictures here, you can see here, that's what I mentioned as the hamster mouth with the animals packing the food in the mouth. And this is a drinker. And the reason why I put the drinker is because many animals, although they drop the food out of the mouth, in the feeder, they are able to re-eat it. But when they drop it into the water, they are not able to get it back. So if we have a, a drinker that is continuously dirty, that may mean that the animal is dropping food out of the mouth when they go to drink. Some of the pictures, as you can see, animals losing saliva. That's a picture, is a post-mortem picture of the food trapped in between two teeth, and this is causing the, the, the smell. This is very painful. Diastomas with periodontal disease are very painful, and this is the cause of bad smell. Very bad condition, and those who work with donkeys, it is very important to palpate the animals because even if they lose body condition because of the hair, or even a, a draft horse or a mule in the winter, it may be more difficult to identify the, the, the loss of the body condition. And here you have a unilateral nasal discharge, okay? And again, referring to donkeys, it's very important. We need to get used to palpate our animals. First, we'll stimulate the contact with them and that's good for them. And second, in very hairy donkeys like the ones I have at home or the ones that Pete has at home, even severe situations like this, you see a, an old tumor in a, in a mandible, may be unnoticed because the hair is so much that you don't see something happen. So it's very important that as part of the daily contact with the animals, we get used to, talk, to touch with the animals, to be in contact with them, okay? So this was the, like the first part of the, the, the or two thirds of the, 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 the presentation. And now I would like to, to mention a little bit about working equids and dentistry, okay? So, some comments, you know, and we, 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 for those who doesn't know, there are around 
112 million donkeys in the world, not donkeys, sorry, equids in the world. And they are actually develop, doing tasks in all kinds of environments. In urban environments, in mountain areas like in Peru, or in different types of forestry, or vineyards, or agricultural work. So all these animals are uh, working equids, and I would like to share with you a number that I think is really relevant. Some numbers pointed that 10% of the equids worldwide have access to 90% of all veterinary care. By saying this in a different way, that means that 90% of the equids worldwide only have access to 10% of the veterinary care. And veterinary care in general, equidentistry is not an exception. So there are 90% of these 112 million equids who never have any kind of uh, continuous dental treatment. Okay, so these, these animals, they never receive any dental treatment or they never receive at least continuous dental treatment. Okay, and what I think is really important is that I think it's clear now that dentistry should be something prophylactic, should be something, and it's a little bit like us in humans. It's better to prevent the problems than to have to treat the problems, okay? And the importance of early interventions. What I think is really important here for those who have horses or, the, or, my, or, or, or donkeys or mules, examination doesn't mean treatment. Animals should receive regular examination and if there's something to treat, they should receive treatment. Otherwise, it's perfect. That's what I call prophylactic care. A little bit like us, we don't need to to wait to have a dental problem to go to the dentist. We should go to the dentistry on a regular basis exactly to avoid problems, okay? So, and again, if there are no early interventions, situations like the one I showed you before will affect the animals for the rest of their life because a simple situation like this that is pretty much eliminating these two teeth that are retained, if no one solved the problem, uh, it will cause problems for the rest of, the, of their life, okay? Then another problem affecting millions and millions and millions of equids is actually the lack of knowledge that the owners may have, okay? So millions of the users of these animals all over the world, not only in Africa or not only in the Americas, even in Europe, even in, in, our, in our countries, many millions of equid owners and users, they have a limited knowledge in terms of health and welfare. Okay, and the oral cavity is still a hidden problem. They are not this, if an animal is lame or if there is a wound that is bleeding, you will see it very easily. Inside the mouth is not that easy. And then we have to, 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 to be aware that there are a lot of traditional practices that they are after all harmful practices. I'll give you some examples. A very common practice is to eliminate what they call the lampus. And the lampus is no more than the hard pellet that gets inflamed when the milk teeth are replaced by the definitive teeth. In many places, they burn it, they wash it with vinegar, they cut it, they bleed it, because people believe that by doing that, they will solve the problem of the animal. Wolf teeth, for example, is that vestigial teeth that I mentioned, they were blamed for centuries, for blindness of the horses, for stubborn in the donkeys, for all kinds of situations. So there are still a lot, of, a lot of these traditional practices that may really link with the mouth that may really affect the animals, okay? And when I say there is a, a, a hidden problem, for example, that picture is from Mexico. Luis Eduardo, this picture is from Villarreal. And it was very interesting because that was the tongue of an animal that actually the only source of fiber was the, the, the leaves of the corn. And those who already touched the leaves of the corns, you know how aggressive they can be. And that was, and the, the owner actually, he was aware of the situation, but he said, that's the only source of fiber I have. And it's with what I have to feed my animals, okay? And of course, when you work a lot with dentistry, you will find the most amazing things. This is a picture in Morocco where I found a leash under the, under the tongue. And actually when we remove it, it was, it was bleeding a lot. It was from a, a, an area with swamps and this, this mule was drinking from a, from a, a lake and we could find a, a leech there. So education is fundamental. This is, this, I, I, really, I really love this picture. This, this young boy, he was really, really trying to understand what I was doing. That was his mule. So I try my best to find a solution for him to watch inside. And I try my best to educate people every time 
we do this 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 type of work. I, I always try to explain to the people that I I work with the owners of the animals the importance and somehow the message I'm giving you here in detail try to to transmit this this message. Another important another problem is actually the handling techniques. We cannot forget that actually we communicate with the equids mainly through the mouth, through the head, with a head collar, with a bridle, with a bit, with a hackamore. So the owner's communication skills may sometimes, or the lack of communication skills, may sometimes create a lot of problems in the, to, to these animals. Traumas, physical traumas, behavioral traumas. This example, the examples I'm using here, for example, this is a traditional head collar from the donkeys I work at my PhD. And as you can see, there is a nose band and there's no chin band. What there is, there is a chain and it's a, it's a strangulating system. So every time they pull the chain, they pretty much stimulate the contact. And as you can see, there is an ulcer. This is exactly the same animal where the ring is, if you look inside the mouth, you will see an ulcer due to the contact of these teeth. And there's nothing wrong with the teeth, but the systems that humans develop to communicate with animals, sometimes they cause the problems, okay? And then all the handling methods can be really, really, really traumatic, but they are after all uh, the result of people trying to find solutions. And I'll give you another example here. For example, when I look to this case, this is the typical system they use in Spain to winning the false. So they just put this, the false with his nails, the false try to have got access to the milk. Uh, this is of course painful for the mare and the mare goes away. But in this case, the mare delivered a kick and actually broke a tooth to this poor donkey as a result of an incorrect handling technique and a, and a bad practice, okay? And then going back to the communication, for example, this is a homemade bit and you can see the trauma that is causing in the lips. Or going to another example, this is the typical ring beads used in many parts of Africa and this is the tongue of this animal and you can perfectly see that the tongue is almost amputated due to these incorrect techniques. Uh, and of course, there's no point to go to this place and say your bit is, is, is bad if you don't give a solution. So sometimes it's, it's very important. It's very complex because you have to understand the socioeconomic context where these animals work and try to work uh, with the local partners and try to work with these people to look for, for solution. So as a, as a conclusion and final remarks, I'd just like to say that Many studies focus on equids emphasize the fact that the presence of oral and dental disorders need to be taken into account when assessing the health and welfare of donkeys, horses, mules, all the animals, we, all the equids we talk, and that dentistry should be assumed as something prophylactic through the early diagnosis and treatment of oral and dental disorders, avoiding kids developing into potential clinical significant disorders. And as a final one, education at all levels should be an integral part of this process, especially when we're talking about working equids with a high number of animals suffering from asymptomatic dental and oral disorders. And with this, thank you very much for your attention. I will now stop sharing the screen and uh, more than happy to answer any questions you may have. We are only nine if you want to turn up your microphones and your cameras and we can have a conversation. There we go. Hello, Joao, can you hear me? Hello, Sask, welcome. Hello, hello. Sorry I arrived a bit late because I was finishing from the other meeting and actually I'm driving back home now, so that's why I don't turn the camera okay. on. So you see me here driving. No, my question is, well, I just just saw half of the of the presentation. Mm -hmm. my, my my concern is, as you know, as the uh, owner of new new donkeys, one ten years and the other one two years. Uh, to start uh, introducing the dentist to a young uh, animal, so it doesn't, you know, has a bad bad experience that okay. uh, will make more difficult in the future to have a second or a third visit. Is is there any way? No, because I, I had my other two mares treated, and and they had to sedate them, and 
I mean, it was not a, an easy thing, no? So mm -hmm. I think that the next visit is going to be a problem. Is there any way to, to make it easier? Maybe just have a visit without anything else, no? Without pulling any teeth or something like that. Is there any way okay. you think it's good? That's, that's it. Okay, Seth, so that's, that's a very good question. First, usually, uh, what it's, we, we need to differentiate two things here. One is what we call the routine dentist, that it's pretty much balanced the mouth, and that is 90% of the work dentists do, it's based on that. It's based on rasping, balancing the mouth. It's a non-painful procedure, okay? Although in these first five years of age, it may be uh, linked to the extraction of the caps, the milk teeth. In that case, my advice, and for, for, a, uh, for the health and safety of both animals and vets, sedation, it is an option, you know? Very quiet environment, you just sedate the animal, use the appropriate protocol, animal will be sedated. If you think the animal is still a little bit nervous, you can uh, blind the animal just to avoid visual stimuli. You do your work, you know, in a quiet environment, and that will work. Every horse I treat, I always sedate them. Okay, and that's due to the nature of horses. They explode first and they think after that. When they run through me, through the equipment, through the stable, and 300 meters later, they'll say, well, there was nothing to, to be afraid of. Then kids, they usually don't do that. They try to understand if you can, if there's a really a good reason to be afraid of. So if the, if the dentist is confident enough, to do things step by step, very gradually, put the gag, opening the mouth, uh, check inside, close every 30 seconds, 45 seconds, and do things in a very gentle way, dentistry can be introduced to dentists in a way that is not traumatic. Of course, you'll always face the situation that vets are always on a rush and they never have time for anything. So they, it's you wanting to have things done properly in a quiet way and the vet wants to do things done to go to the next client. So it's, it's a balance. So my advice is with your donkeys, if you're the first time, if the guy is familiar with the doses and with the protocols for donkeys, you should ask your vet to sedate the animal. At least to have a, a, a clear view of the needs and then because after the first visit, the dentist can start what is called a treatment or a, a, a visit protocol. These animals, for example, with bad mouth, they should receive a treatment every six months. Although your donkey with 10 years old, after the first treatment, if the mouth is, let's say, normal without malocclusions and things like that, maybe you only need a treatment every year. Okay, so uh, that's, that's what I'll do. The first time with sedation and then step by step, especially if the donkeys have previous traumas. Usually that's the problem with the head is that you want to go and rasp the mouth, but if the previous owner was usually a bad communicator with the animal, all the traumas will be around the head. So every time you move in front of the animal, you have a bad reaction. Or for example, donkeys with these strangulated head collars, the traditional ones, were a pain because the animals, every time you try to touch the mouth, the only contact they had with people with, in the head was to create a trauma. So those cases were, were somehow uh, more difficult to treat.